Hey everyone and welcome to our session today. My name is Mina and I know many of you, I am a water advocate um, and I've spent a lot of the last five years doing some pretty crazy things for water, running in some extreme environments and meeting hundreds of people on the front lines of the water crisis to understand their stories and to work with media to tell those stories to the world. And I'm joined here by the fabulous Matthias. Would you like to introduce yourself? I mean, uh, yeah, I'm Matthias. Uh, I actually have been spending a lot of my career worrying about climate change. And the more I worried about climate change, the more I ended up being really worried about water. Uh, it's a big topic. Uh, it hits me personally, but also in my professional life. Uh, I work at Bayer, um, uh, support the company in their sustainability strategy. And given that Bayer is a company very deeply involved in agriculture, Water is a really uh, big deal for us and more importantly, for the farmers around the world. Yeah, you've spent a lot of time actually traveling to some of the, like I have also traveling to these places that are literally on the front line of the, of the crisis. Um, can you talk, maybe share some of these stories and particularly I was struck by some of your comments that you made when we, when we met early on about Brazil and the impact that the water crisis is having in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, I realized is how uh, democratic, if you will, um, uh, the, the water crisis is. Uh, no matter where you go, rich countries or poor countries, uh, you can find people suffering from the water crisis. I'm currently in the United States, uh, and I'm sure we're going to talk about the water issues here in a second as well. But what's striking is uh, what's currently going on in Brazil. We are facing the worst drought in uh, this century and the first drought at a time where um, uh, Brazil is really one of those agricultural superpowers. And apparently what we're going to see in the center of the country is that if you chop down the rainforest, you also lose the rain. Compounded, uh, compounded with a huge La Nina effect, uh, you, you lost almost one third of, um, of corn crop this year in Brazil. This huge drought and the worry is that as a result of that, for many farmers, the current practice of having basically two harvests in a season is in jeopardy. And of course, the reaction will be uh, to clear more land. And if you clear more land, you lose more forests. And forests, I reckon, are one of the key elements that help us to fight the water crisis. So uh, deforestation is one of the reasons for the water crisis and forest protection, of course, would help us to avert it. Yeah, but there's so many ways that we could um, run this conversation because a couple of things that you said to me, you just said just now made me think, you know, the first one is this, this issue that it's easy for us to think that the water crisis is someone else's problem. It exists on the other side of the planet. You know, we live in big cities where water comes out of a tap. We've got enough power for our computers and we can go down the grocery store and we can buy our groceries. And it's easy to forget that we're all linked through our global supply chains to these water issues, irrespective of where we live. You know, whether we live in the United States and we're connected to supply chains in Brazil or whether we live in Brazil and we're connected to supply chains in places like India. And I think, you know, it's very, it's very easy for us to forget that water doesn't just touch the environment, water touches all these different aspects along the supply chain from the environment, which is the source obviously of water because water does not come from a tap, water comes from an ecosystem. So it touches, it touches that very root of where our water comes from. But then it also touches economies and societies and communities and all of these other aspects, um, uh, including, you know, including health. So I think it's, you know, it's just really interesting to reflect on where where we are all touched by this water crisis and the fact that it is not just about a one issue problem it's actually having it has major consequences right throughout a, a variety of different places i think that's that's for me one of the one of the key things also when you look at how people talk about water um uh, i feel there is kind of a bit of a consensus you go through the religions um, you, you go through different countries. I think water in general is a topic that um, uh, has the potential to divide the world and create conflicts, but it's also a huge uniting factor. 
And you have been uh, working on this topic, engaged in this topic for a long time. So um, how did you experience the united, the uniting part of the water crisis? Can you share a few stories about that? Uh, yes. <laughs> so I guess um, what's really interesting to me is on the front line, when you speak to communities, there is a very strong sense of unity that we're all battling, we're together battling a common problem. So if you, you know, ran through the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan, um, and it is a place that used to be one of the biggest inland oceans in the world, and it's now less than 10% of its size. When you go there, I literally ran through the carcasses of these old shipping boats and you can meet, we met some of the fishermen who have watched as this enormous ocean has been drained over the last 30 years, primarily for agriculture. But what's happened is that they've been left with no ability to earn an income, no revenue sources, and the, the township has been completely decimated. What's happened is that within those communities, it's been a real opportunity in some ways for them to join together and say, we have a common battle, which is water scarcity or water problems or the government who hasn't properly managed the water supplies. And the same thing is exactly the same thing is happening in the Great Salt Lake in the United States in Utah, where they are also watching the water being drained from their lake. And you can see online, anyone who's interested, just Google online, you can literally see over the last 20 years, the water's receding. And those communities are also saying, we have a major problem. Our fear is that we will become the next RLC because we can literally watch the plug being lifted out and our water being drained. And what's interesting there is the same thing has happened. This has been a community building, like the community has come together and said, we don't want to become the next RLC because we need our agriculture, we need our communities, but we also need our health. And there's a massive amount of arsenic in the ground and we don't want our children to, to be breathing that in from the clouds of arsenic that will be blown up when the waters recede. So I think on the front line, there is a huge, it is a bonding and communities are joining together. At a more macro level, it is completely the reverse because in the water space, we see limited pools of funding, limit what has been traditionally a limited number of the private sector who have been engaged in water. Um, we can talk a bit about water blindness, but I'm horrified at how few corporates and, and private companies are actually engaged in the thing that they depend and their supply chains depend on so heavily. But for now, a limited number of funders, a limited amount of private sector opportunities, which means that when you have a plethora of NGOs, what is happening is that it's like the vultures coming and feeding on the carcasses and you see this huge competition amongst the NGOs. So whilst I would like to see a more together water community and whilst I think that that is absolutely essential if we're going to solve this problem, at the moment, we're far away from that happening, very, very sadly. And I, think, I actually think that we have a very unique opportunity between now and 2023, when the UN is hosting their first conference on water in 50 years, um, for us to, as an NGO community, say enough is enough. We need to step up together and we need to work together, not just the NGOs, but the NGOs, the companies, the investors, everybody in the multilateral institutions, we all need to unite and say, this is a problem that is bigger than any single one of us. And if we join together, we can fix it. And if we stay in our little silos competing against one another, we will fail. And that's a failure, not just for us, but also for the next generation. And that is really sad. You know, when you were running, you talked about running uh, by the RLC, but there is, of course, many other places you were running as well. And one of them is in the Colorado River Basin, Lake Mead. Um, this is gonna be a big topic in the months to come, given the water crisis there. What's your impression uh, about what's going on currently in Colorado? Yeah, I think Colorado is in a really dire situation. I ran, um, in 2017, I ran down six of the world's great rivers. And one of the rivers was the Colorado. And I spent some time running around and through Lake Mead. And even back in 2017, the scientists, the water experts, the farming communities all said, we are in a terribly dire situation. And unless we do something, 
in the next five years, this is just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And even back then, you know, I was this tiny little, just to put this in perspective, I was a tiny little person running and I looked up at the bathtub rings around Lake Mead and they were miles above me. We went and we saw the, um, there are these things, these constructions that like piers, if you like, that go out into Lake Mead to allow people to measure the depth and they are so far out of the water that you can see all the water marks all the way down and at the bottom you just see literally sludge the even like this is 2017 this is a long time ago we're now four years later and we see in the news that they're about the the government is going to introduce a whole series of restrictions um just this month as as we were talking about just this month to 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 restrict the amount of water that's available to to farmers and to others and i think that that's going to have an incredible impact on local communities i don't know what your what is your perspective on on this whole crisis i mean it is similar to what we discussed in brazil it's one of the worst droughts um in in this century for sure in in 100 years um and uh, what I find striking is wherever you face this water crisis, you see the same effects. So hydroelectric power is going down. So access to electricity for many co communities is going to get much harder. Um, and, and we see that even in a rich country like the United States. And then the other thing you'll see in the water crisis, um, the first collateral is always farming. So water supply for farmers is being cut by 40%. And these are not like the super wealthy farmers. So these are people who barely make a living farming in some of those communities along the Colorado River Basin. And, and I feel that we, we, we tend to look at farming just as a water consumer, but you can also see how those farming communities suddenly become the victims of the water crisis. And that's deeply worrying me. And to have like the state of a federal emergency it was something we saw all long coming, but to now really face that just indicates how huge the water crisis is. Okay, I, I agree with you that the water crisis is terrible, but what can we do to solve this? Like, what's the solution? I mean, I feel like we're rapidly heading towards a disaster and there's got to be a way we can do something about it to avert this, this horror. And, and this is, in my book, the link to climate change. I mean, the reason why we have this water crisis is if you look at the snow masses and the Rocky Mountains, they're just not uh, at levels they have been before. So those uh, basins don't get as much melting water um, uh, that feeds them as before. Also, you have sometimes torrential rainfall, but that rainfall really doesn't feed the basins in the way before. So the weather is turning more and more extreme. So uh, this for me is just indicating how climate action and the water crisis are intertwined. Uh, that's one thing we need to do. The other thing is it's about water consumption. I think what communities will face uh, along the river basin, large cities like Las Vegas who have been fighting the water topic for a long time is an other nudge of uh, kind of reduction of water consumption. and. Uh, that just gives a flavor of the billions we need to invest if we don't solve problems like climate change and if we don't slow down uh, the temperature increase around the world. And fundamentally, we all agree that SDG 6 is a good idea. SDG 6 has a series of goals and objectives and we should actually move towards achieving those. So first thing is we can actually agree that we have a common, what I call a North Star, um, you know, Plastics has its ban the bag and climate change has its 1.5 degrees. You know, maybe we do have this joint thing that we can all get behind. Um, but it's got to be bigger than that. It's got to be something that we can all, that's not just about one organisation achieving its own goals. It's got to be about something, something bigger and bolder and more ambitious um, and something that really inspires and motivates people and does two things. Um, I think we need to, well, not only three things, inspire um, and motivate, but we also need something that um, really starts to put water onto the agenda and really builds and mobilizes a mass number of people so that we start to actually push this, this issue up. And I think the third thing, which I'd really be interested in your views on is we need to do something which engages the corporate sector 
because too many CEOs and too many people in senior positions in government are blind to the issue of water. And I would be very interested because you've managed to move Bayer to be one, to move from not really having a major public position on water to being a water leader. You've spoken at the United Nations alongside the Secretary General. You've spoken in various different forums um, to extremely influential people. I know you've been called on by heads of state and governors and others to give your opinion to them on these issues. So how have you managed to move the organisation into a position where you have effectively cured the blindness to this issue that existed that existed internally? And I guess what lessons can we can we as a community take from that and apply to the broader issue of getting more and more people involved? For me, it was the realization uh, how important water is for for Bayer's value chain, and on the on the health side, how much what Bayer is working on is linked to this water crisis. So when you are a company, a healthcare company, that actually works in cardiovascular, you just realize how many people are increasingly suffering from cardiovascular in times of heat and also lack of access to safe drinking water. And of course, uh, this combination of both nutrition and health uh, is something that is hugely relevant for Bayer because uh, uh, these are the two areas uh, the company is, is operating in. Um, the other thing that helped me to get my arms around the water topic is the level of enterprise risk that is linked to water. Um, more than 70% of, of a plant uh, is water. So in other words, we can sell a lot to farmers. We can sell better seeds. We can sell crop protection. We can sell digital solutions. What we really can't sell is water. Um, yes, you can work on irrigation systems, but everything has its limitation if global water cycles uh, continue to um, uh, to be completely messed up like they like they are at the moment. And uh, for that reason, um, I felt um, if there's one risky topic we need to focus on, it's water. And what also helped is that some of our major investors, for example, BlackRock, realized that when they think about the climate crisis, they have to actually worry about the water crisis. And this shift in the investment base to focus more on the environment and to look at climate related risks, um, uh, not just at the headlines, but really deep into the value chains uh, has helped Bayer to focus more and really around the topic of water. Yeah, I, I think if, that... I, if I may ask you, you one question um, yeah. uh, that, that, that you touched on and it's water blindness. Um, it's a topic often used in the discussion. How would you describe water blindness and what is the opposite for you? So what is the end game of what you are trying to do in the water space? Yeah, easy, because I see this issue of blindness all the time, sadly. I'll give you an example. Meet a CEO. The CEO says, Mina, what do you do? And I explain in a as briefly and as um, kindly to myself and my own crazy running adventures as I can. Um, and we have a conversation. I mentioned water. And they say, oh, we, we don't do anything about water. And I've had this conversation with um, some of the FMCG companies who rely extremely heavily on water right throughout their supply chain. No water, um, no showers, no showers, no purchasing shampoos or other bathroom related products. That's just an immediate thing. Or, you know, we don't, they don't have a sense of how water reliant their supply chains truly are. And their eyes will glaze over at a conversation about water or they immediately start thinking about toilets and taps. And you have to try to explain that it's far greater than that. And I think even those CEOs who understand the water problem or understand that they might be impacted by water don't understand the sense of urgency and scale of the problem. So what is the counter to that? The counter is to meet someone, to be honest, like you, who says, I understand that water is a major issue. I understand that our supply chains and our opportunities are heavily linked to a better management system around water. And for us to understand how those risks will impact on our business, not just today and tomorrow, but going forward. And that that is not just a risk, but it is also an opportunity. And I think that kind of sense of water enlightenment, unfortunately, is far too rare. 
And what we need to do, especially before 2023, is we need to spread that sense of enlightenment and that sense that water is not just a risk, but actually when we do it right, it's an opportunity. We need to spread that right throughout all the major corporations and right through deep into their supply chains, because unless we do that, we will not solve this problem. And unless we do that, we will end up on the steps of the UN in 2023 with meaningless words instead of meaningful action. I think investors play a key role here, Mina. Uh, I do believe that in the enterprise risk management, the more investors uh, force companies to look at climate related risks, the more likely those companies will end up um, looking at the topic of water. That, that is one very important ingredient. Uh, the other ingredient for me is um, transparency. So if you think about the carbon disclosure project, they um, basically don't only look at carbon, they just edit forests, but they also have a very long tradition to look at the topic of water. So I believe that disclosure on water related topics is really important. But the main ingredient for me um, is a realization how elemental water is for all of elementary water is for all of those topics. And um, uh, that is still a long way to go. I can see that also in the discussions uh, that we have in our value chain. Um, uh, people, um, and I think you said that, right? So uh, 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 people uh, uh, value water um, uh, and treat it as if it were uh, uh, nothing, even though it's, it's worth everything. Yeah? So there is this huge risk that we are having that we are under value water. So uh, changing that through looking at the risk is probably the most important thing we need to do. And also looking at the innovation opportunities revolving around water. I believe that both in seed production, in irrigation systems, uh, in the link of reforestation to agriculture, uh, we can create a lot of opportunities. Um, and, and, and these are the two things I would do. So very basic, the risks and the opportunities need to be spelled out uh, more clearly. What message would you give to the NGO community and also to people who are like watching or listening to this right now of individuals to say, you know, who is probably sitting there, hopefully sitting there and saying, what can we do? What would you, what would you suggest to the NGOs and to these individuals and say, you know, walking away from this conversation, this is the lesson I want you to take. And this is the action I want you to take. We, we are currently working with a couple of NGOs, a couple of companies, and uh, also a couple of governments uh, to drive, um, uh, uh, yeah, let's say, rainforest protection programs, the largest rainforest protection program ever established in the world in the run up to COP26. Uh, it's called the LEAF um, Coalition. And I think the very same ingredients we need for the water topic. And that's basically how we met. So uh, when we talk about creating this coalition, um, uh, we, we, we try to bring the same key stakeholders together. And perhaps that's a good opportunity for you to talk a bit about your vision behind what will be the six for six campaign in water. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm really excited about this because I do think that we need to unify the water community around um, a common goal and a pathway to get there. And I know that I've spoken to many of the people that are listening on this on this call about your ideas. You know, when I very first started running, I got a lot of questions. Well, Mina, I understand how horrific the water crisis is. We want to act. What do you think we should do about it? And I asked a lot of people. You know, I'm not. I don't portray myself as a water expert for a single minute, but. I do ask people and I like to listen to what people have to say. And so when I asked, everybody said, this is not one a one solution problem. This is not a one hit pony. This is actually like there are multiple solutions here. And it turns out that there are solutions that can be put into six different buckets, quantity, quality, transparency, water, water and sanitation and hygiene, um, collective action. Um, and valuing water. So those are the six kind of, if you if you look at all the initiatives that exist in the water space, they can be pretty neatly put into these six, in six groups. And if we can get organizations together to work around, as you, as you said, Matthias, like create this community 
create this coalition that can get behind saying, here is our pathway to action. Here is our six things that we need people to do for SDG six. Then just maybe we can get to a point where we say, this is not for me or for you to act. This is for all of us to act. This is something that we can all do together to actually make this work. And if we can do that by the time the UN starts their conference in 2023, then we'll achieve some dramatic change. You know, someone said to me just before I finished running um, my last campaign, individually, you can make an impact, but together we can change the world. They're absolutely right. And we have a very unique mo opportunity and a moment in time to do just that over the next 18 months. And I really hope that we have the strength and the courage as a community to take that step, to put our hand out and say, we are all in this together. You can certainly count on me and uh, having worked with you for more than a year now on the topic, I'm sure we will find quite a few sometimes differing, but uh, uh, rallying around the water topic and unifying organizations and individuals to do that. So thanks for starting the initiative and also thanks for this great conversation today.